Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of On Brand, where we'll be discussing the myths and truths of digital well-being. It was World Mental Health Week last week that saw a lot of activity here at Dentsu Aegis Network. Here in the UK, the Reclaim Your Break campaign encouraged employees to take their lunch away from their desks, while the Monday mindfulness sessions continue to grow in popularity. So it seems like the right time to have a conversation about well-being in the digital age. And I'm thrilled to be joined by two illustrious leaders in this space. Tia Castaño, Managing Director and Global Head of Innovation at Visium, who's been leading innovation at Visium for over four years, uh, is the Burberry and IKEA Client President, brings over 15 years of media experience, but on top of that is also a master and teacher of yoga and meditation for the last 10 years and is a certified resilience trainer. So I'm sure we'll be learning a lot from you today, Tia. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm also thrilled to welcome Mads Madison all the way from Norway, uh, CEO and co-founder of the Hold app. This app incentivizes students to basically put their phone down in a screen-obsessed world. Um, and Hold has quickly gained traction in Norway with over 50% of the student population now using the app. Uh, they were just awarded Mobile Marketing Product of the Year, uh, and they have brands such as Coca-Cola, Sky, and Disney supporting their mission. So thank you so much, guys, for joining us today. Uh, for those who are tuning in uh, live, you can send your questions to Tia and Matt. Now's your chance. You can send your comments and questions in the Facebook feed below, or you can tweet us using the on-brand hashtag. Uh, and in fact, if you're listening to this on the podcast later, or you're watching this on Facebook later, then do send your, your questions through anyway, and we'll do our best to answer them. So um, thanks again, guys, for joining us. I suppose to kick things off, the big question, why? Why is it so important to raise awareness of well-being, mental health in the workplace, regardless of the industry? Mads, what's your, what's your view on that? Uh, I think we have to start with the fact that we spend one third of our day working, uh, maybe more if you check your emails when you come home, late night, etc. And, and the fact that it's all s connected to other parts of your life. If you're not happy at work, you will not be happy when you come home, you will not sleep well, and then you will not do as good while being at work. And I think that uh, companies need to understand the cost that this has if they don't actually do something about it, make sure that people working inside my company are happy. Uh, they can, people will be burned out, they will be more often sick, and I think it's time to actually start putting attention to this topic. Yeah, Tia, do you feel the same? Do you think it's important? To Absolutely. Uh, I think um, technology is here to stay. Uh, we'll continue to increase uh, the importance that it has in, in our lives moving forward. So we want to get that relationship right from the beginning. Also because it has brought so many positives and at the moment there's a lot of focus on the negatives. And like in any long-term relationship, in order to make it work, uh, we need to put the um, like fundamental elements right uh, from the beginning so that then we can go on the right track and making sure that we use it to our advantage and not to our detriment. Right, and, and I suppose just being more proactive, right, instead of being more reactive. Um, and I, I suppose there's been some quite concerning research recently around the number of hours we spend. I think it's an average of four hours a day that we spend on our devices. I know that my phone is the first thing I look at in the morning, the last thing I look at at night. Um, is it in fact impacting our physical, our emotional, our mental well-being? Or yes, all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> For different reasons and um, I'll, I'll try and touch on some of the neuroscience behind it and um, the, the scientific reasons for it. but. Basically, when we, we work, the way we work is that we use energy and we need to replenish that energy continuously. So we use it, we replenish, we use it, we replenish. And looking at your screen doesn't really allow you uh, to replenish. And often there is an illusion that maybe it does. So you take your downtime looking at your screen and you think you're relaxing, but actually you're activating parts of your brain that still activate the sympathetic nervous system. So keep you very alert, especially if you're going through emails or um, if you're seeing a call that maybe you didn't want to see or a message or even on social media. Mm. I'm sure we're going to touch on this more later. But um, often what you see is not always like pleasing and maybe there is uh, some jealousy or various emotions that come into play. And 
overall is activating a part of us that doesn't allow us to relax. Mm -hmm. So when we take time off, we should take time off from screens. At the same time, though, we need to understand what those four hours really constitute and what they're about. Do they include the time that we spend also on computers and tablets mm -hmm. and so on? And, you know, may, perhaps we take calls for work on, on our phone, in, in which case it means that those four hours are perhaps less. So I think the averages are a great way to uh, get us into action. But at the same time, we need to, at individual level, go and check how we spend that time and how we can make sure we include proper downtime. Yeah, I mean, if I think about how many hours I spend in front of my screen at work, you know, my desktop, my laptop, as well my phone, tablet, it's probably a lot more than four hours. And uh, you know, I'd say even my eyesight has been affected a little bit mm. recently as well. So um, it's a little bit worrying. Do you, do you feel, Maz, that there's an impact on physical, mental, emotional? Yeah, let's, of course. The point that you just had that you're sitting in front of your screen the entire day, of course, that's going to have impact on how kind of active you are and your physical health uh, for kids kids growing up today maybe be affected by they don't are they don't, they're not that active mm. they don't go out and play they rather play together uh, playing uh, a game like uh, different games they can play on social media or mm -hmm. platforms uh, and I think that uh, that's on the physical part but more importantly kind of the, the mental part behind it there is um, how we maybe are per, uh, uh, see ourselves as a better version than what we really are. That's how we kind of present ourselves on social media. You post a picture on on kind of, on kind of Instagram, uh, and you put the filter on it, so you look prettier. Uh, your food looks better, and your vacation is much nicer. And but so does your friends, and that means that and they only post the best part of their life. They don't see the hard work needed in order to achieve to achieve the great vacation and to be fit etc <laughs> they don't see how much that costs and that's the thing that I think those uh, will really be put or can break people down and we see that uh, so depression rate has increased by 66 percent the last five years and I think that we need to spend time and understand how why this is happening and kind of the last point is also how social media today is built up uh, with the aim to connect you, but right now they are not, they are able to connect you and make people talk to each other with text, etc. But they also take away the day-to-day -day chats. And instead of going to your friend and just uh, watching television or uh, talking, you rather sit and have a look at what he's doing and see if his friends are on a party, is on vacation, why you're not invited, and then you feel bad. And then you feel like, okay, I'm, I don't have any friends. Or why don't I have, are we friends anymore? Or, and you question yourself, and I think that's the dangerous. I mean, exposure to knowledge is power, but it's also quite detrimental in some ways because you just inevitably compare yourself don't you and you sort of put yourself on that that um, comparison mm. um, I suppose to look at the other side of the coin very quickly technology can't be all that bad um, you know the digital economy has also driven a lot of prosperity and you know knowledge is is a great thing um, Mads your target audience is comprised of a lot of digital natives um, what positive traits have you found dealing with an audience who's never really known a world outside of uh, smartphones or social mm. media? I think it's uh, proven that the uh, human mind are great. Like we are showing that today we can handle much more complex issues and uh, problems. And if you look at uh, the number of, like the amount of data our mind process per day, today we process 34 gigs of data every day but if you go back 25 years it was only six gig it's kind of the same brain right mm -hmm. but it's kind upgraded. of we adapt. <laughs> yeah and we have <laughs> learned how to process more information and to kind of exemplify in this it's uh, how you kind of go buy a bike if you go 25 years back you go to the local shop you ask the local guy to uh, which bikes do you have and you ha he maybe have two if you're lucky he has two and then you have to trust him 
and, mm. uh, and you don't know if the price is right, quote, etc. But if I do the same thing now, and in a number of minutes, I'll be able to browse, browse maybe 100 different bikes. I can check the quality, price, I can talk to pairs, see what they feel about it. And I know I can process that kind of information in much f faster. More informed decisions. Yeah. yeah. And that's great. And uh, that, I think that's one of the really key things that we have to think about, that um, we can use tech in a really good way. We just need some help to do it. And the fact that uh, people uh, now are really, they, have, they really, they know what they want to achieve. They have high expectation of themselves, clear goals. Uh, we just need to push them to, to get there. And they they really want everything to be kind of open. They want uh, transparency, which they kind of uh, want from themselves, but also from brands. So I kind of think it's interesting how this next, next generation are really informed uh, and can achieve great things. They just need to understand a bit how to kind of spend their time well and not yeah. spend all the time on Candy Crush instead of <laughs> finishing the last chapter. So. Achieving that balance, right. Um, for anyone who's tuning in, uh, if you do have questions for Tia and Mads, please do send them through and we'll do our best to answer them later on. Um, Mads, obviously your, your app was originally designed for a, a much younger audience, at least originally. So a question is, why is it important to raise awareness of mental health issues at an earlier age and, and know how to manage it and, and prevent that from happening earlier? I think first uh, that today we're, we're born with screens. We use the iPad as a baby, babysitter, kind of. That, that's what you use to make sure that your kids are quiet for some hours and you can spend time with yourself, either just to chill or actually do some work. Uh, and I think that we need to understand the impact that this has from early age and actually get people to start talking about this problem and, mm. uh, and kind, of, kind of understand the impact. I think it's much, maybe much more common now but uh, still, we have a long way to go when we need to focus on this. Yeah, and, and Tia, you obviously work with uh, probably quite a lot of brands that, that deal mm. with younger audiences. Are you, seeing, are, are you seeing why it's so important to address it at an earlier age with these brands? Yes, uh, I think you know, in the responsibility is in the fact that um, when we, in the workplace, uh, when we have mental health issues, of course, they can be caused by burnout, but most of um, other more serious mental health issues like depression, anxiety, um, they can often be tracked back, 85% can be tracked back to teen years between 12 and 14. So that is uh, a fundamental age where you need to get the relationship with uh, technology right, but also the relationship with mental health right, and those mm -hmm. you know intertwine. And um, uh, I think that that's when you need to start educating because then you can channel it in the right direction. And going back to some of the points that you were making earlier, I think internet and digital in general has really opened so many choices and possibilities for this new generations. There are generations of um, hustlers and they want to create stuff and um, digital allows them to do that, but they need to create the frame around that so they can be contained and it can really almost help them achieve more rather than be detrimental to what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, I mean, clearly it's important to, to raise the awareness, but I suppose as part of that, are there any um, myths or assumptions that are held generally that need busting that we need to kind of address and correct? Yes, I think you know there, there's many, but the one that it really strikes me is the fact that um, um, there is this belief that there is one rule that fits all in these uh, circumstances, and, and I guess it comes from the right intentions and the right place. So uh, I think it was last year or two years ago that France introduced the kind of cut off time when you know you're not able to send emails or uh, work communication or reach out to people. Um, and as I, as I said, I think that is a step in the right direction, but actually we need to be aware that people have different needs uh, depending on what industry they work in, um, what stage of life they're in. You know, it's very different if I'm just my first job, I'm 25, or if I've had my first child, or if I need to look after my elderly, you know, uh, parent or, or so on. And also lifestyles. 
people make choices and people are different. I might be, I am an early morning person and uh, some people might prefer to work later at night. So we need to create the conditions for people to thrive um, regardless and actually trying to help them whichever conditions they are fitting in and what, whatever situations they are at trying to adapt to. So there is no one rule fits all, you know, people might want to work after 7pm, people might want to need and want to work at weekends and uh, we, we need to make sure that that freedom though doesn't um, I guess overlap onto other people, other people's freedoms, uh, but that they still allowed to work in a way that really helps them thrive. Yeah, so not a one size fits all solution. Yes. Um, Maths, do you see any kind of myths or assumptions out there that kind of need need busting? Yeah, I definitely believe that the or the um, the claim that social media is bad, um, that's not true. Uh, like we talked about, this could potentially be really a really good tool for people to co uh, connect and have control over all their friends and uh, co-workers. Um, <clears throat> but the fact is, uh, what the problem is with this is that we don't use it the right way now. And they don't have incentives to make us use it the right way. Because they are not getting paid for us to connect with their friends, chatting with our friends, and uh, catching up and arrange uh, parties they are getting paid when you scroll when you um, look through this ad and that's kind of the a bit against what they started out with mm. they started out as a way to connect with student mates but now it's kind of more like they want to keep make sure that you use it as much as possible not see your friends you can as long as you stay in the platform they're happy and i think that's uh, that's kind of we just need to help Facebook, Snapchat, etc., to make sure that they can use it the right way because it's a great tool and probably tools that uh, people are using daily to be able to talk about issues, for okay. example. But I think that we need to spend more time and uh, make that, uh, make, give them help to make that happen. Yeah, I think, it, again, it's achieving that balance, isn't it? Mm. Social media does have a terribly bad rap right now. So, <laughs> um, and I suppose there's also that assumption of disconnection, isn't it? Like, that is the solution, just completely disconnecting from everything, which isn't always necessarily the right solution, is it? Oh. Um, so, Tia, obviously, with that in mind, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Um, as Managing Director of Visium, how are you tackling this challenge with your own people? Mm -hmm. I think exactly what I said earlier, creating the culture and environment where people have their own responsibility and they don't feel that uh, they need to abide to certain rules and uh, that they can't work in a way that fits their own uh, life in, the, in that moment. And I think what we've done, uh, we've put focus on the culture that we've created. So we fully embraced flexible working. Uh, we fully embraced giving people the responsibility to work from wherever they want, whenever they want, in the uh, framework of, of course, reaching objectives and uh, um, working on, on client businesses and, and pitches and so on, but taking responsibility within themselves and mm. making sure that also line managers and everyone around them respects that. So I'm you know, all my years here at Visium, I've never seen anyone coming to a line manager or myself or a colleague saying, I need to leave at this time, but I'll be online later or I'm going to catch up you know on Saturday or I can't usually do this these hours during the day uh, and and be told oh no actually that doesn't work for us there is a, a very clear understanding that that's how we operate and how we respect each other and I think that that culture is really what has di differentiated us um, in a way and then of course other initiatives are very important running mindfulness sessions and I run some resilience training myself um, but those all need to be part of a, a cultural setup and shift mm. that you really put in place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess there's there's a lot that we can do as Visium, as Dentsu, Aegis Network. Um, what are we doing with our partners, though, with our clients? Are we driving change with others as well? Yes, I guess. I mean, from a client perspective, 
we are in a way quite lucky, but I guess you, you know, you attract um, people that work in a certain way as well. But we work with clients such as uh, IKEA, Burberry, Sonos that are really, really strong on these issues. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Sonos, uh, especially with the listening and uh, also mindfulness side of it, and IKEA is very well known for uh, being a super, super fair uh, brand in, in all um, possible ways. And from a partner perspective, um, last year, for instance, we held a session with uh, Holt that um, we run. You know, when you present, it is quite annoying when you look around and you see so many people on, on their yeah. um, phones or sometimes even laptops. Yeah. So we tested this and we invited Holt to uh, actually have an, uh, an award linked to their app just for that group that day so that people stayed off their phone for the entire duration that of the works. session. <laughs> yes, we got the full attention, but at the same time, we also, I guess, spread the awareness of um, how rude it is to be on your phone when you are trying to, you know, you listen to someone else and how uh, bad it is for you that you can't keep yourself, uh, you know, from looking at your phone even mm. for a 20 minute mm. period. And it was very successful. So That's great. Yeah. Breaking the addiction one step at a time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and Mads, obviously, the Hold app is, is hugely uh, successful at kind of tackling the, this problem. I'd be interested to hear a little bit about how you've kind of grown the app beyond just Norway and looking at other age groups beyond just students. You know, have you noticed any differences in terms of the demographics of, of users for your app? Yeah, like we started out as like this student app. We were students, we cared about ourselves, uh, and that worked really well uh, until we launched the app here. Uh, because then we got thousands of downloads and we were so happy, we, like we really cracked this market until we looked, had a look at the kind of app store the day after. And we had an average of 1.3 star on ratings. And I had never downloaded an app that's below two stars, so like we're, we're doomed. Uh, but, but we didn't understand why this is happening. Like we have a 4.5, five star rating, that, that's average. Why is this 1.3 star happening now? Uh, and that was because people couldn't get access to the app. We tailored an app to be student specific. Mm. We didn't understand that the problem we were trying to solve was a problem that families had, corporates had, uh, couples, and they, they bombard us with messages. We get 17,000 emails from angry parents just requesting the app day after. Uh, they were really, re really angry, not that <laughs> nice, so sitting there. And then I feel like this is a mental, uh, uh, yeah, mental state Yeah, that's exercise on its own. Uh, but we solved the problem and tried to tailor, both more, uh, tailor a more kind of open app. Uh, and tailor experience based on who you are instead. Hmm. And that's working quite well. Um, yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. And I, I suppose um, you work with a lot of brands as well. Are there any particular brands that you've worked with that you really admire in terms of tackling this, this issue, um, I guess, with their own employees hmm. more than anything? Uh, so brands that we have worked with, I believe that uh, Tanski Bank is an example of that. They're uh, one of the largest bank we have. Uh, and they have, using Hold as a work-life balance tool, uh, giving Hold, a, like they put up their own exclusive prices for people who are switching off. And they have a, a kind of a high score where you can see who is actually doing best. Uh, and this is from, from top down, from everyone from like the, like, the, like the CEO of the company towards like the junior person just starting the day before. And it's quite interesting to see how uh, they're using Hold, but how, they, how Hold helps them in a different way. For people on the ground, or like more of a junior, uh, junior, uh, junior, uh, junior uh, role, I think it's more important for them to use Hold as a way to kind of complete simple tasks and com got finish, the, finish that uh, presentation, complete, focus on Excel right now. But if you talk, and they use Hold very much during the work day. But if you look at the more of the senior person, they are running around calling between uh, people and are super stressed and they don't have the time to kind of uh, switch off throughout that day. They just need to run around and are just completely occupied. But when they come home, they use Hold to spend time with their kids. 
because that's the way they see that uh, now I need a break. Now I don't want to send that email. I don't want to look at work because I need to spend time with the, what I care, what I what I care what I care most about. Mm. And I think that's uh, the fact that they uh, trusted us as like a student tool, or, and they're willing to see that this issue. That I think that. We know that the solution right now is not kind of perfect yet, but it's a way for us to learn and they adapt, and we adapt to, with them to be able to cope with that. Brilliant. Tia, have you uh, admired any particular brands out there that are doing the job well with their own employees? Um, I, last month I was at a um, learning and development conference, uh, which is mainly for, I guess, management and HR. and. There was a, pre a presentation done by uh, Bupa, so the head of HR at Bupa, which was, uh, left me super impressed. Of course, they are a health company anyway, yeah. <laughs> so it would be they crazy be. if they, yes. <laughs> but the level, so I mean, it just made me think about what level you can really take this to, because mm. um, it wasn't just about um, you know education around uh, email etiquette. Uh, it wasn't just about having the, the yoga class or mindfulness. It went well beyond into emotional intelligence and the impact that negative emotions can have uh, on you in, in the workplace and technology contributes a lot to that um, as we were saying earlier like you know you can get very angry just reading the first line of an email so um, that is when things start to get really advanced mm -hmm. so I was quite impressed you know of course they um, presented it in the best possible way but I'm sure that um, they have um, introduced a lot of those initiatives to talk so um, confidently about it and it sounded like it's been running for quite a long time mm. and that it's quite spread throughout the company rather than only a little bit. Again a proper culture. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so I guess now for a question a little bit closer to home I suppose for us, how can brands and advertisers really leverage mindfulness to I suppose fuel better creativity, better content that resonates? Um, what are some kind of a good examples, perhaps, of some brands mm. that, are, that are doing this? Well, I guess, I mean, Google started all this, right? Because um, they, um, I think, created um, the process. I don't remember what the name is, but it's about those um, creativity sprints mm. that you do to come up with big ideas and thinking. So they've actually created a program that is mindfulness-based. And some of the things that I mentioned earlier, you know, taking time out, uh, going for a walk, lots of the techniques that are used are actually linked to um, old ancient ways to <laughs> uh, access your intuition and come up with great ideas or even solving a problem talking it out, so talking for seven minutes without stopping um, around the problem so that you know all of a sudden you trigger your subconscious mind and you might come up with a solution. Of course, you know, better sleep. So all those things that are actually uh, coming from a very old um, ancient uh, philosophy that they have incorporated in that way of thinking and they have defined programs that they even sell out to, to other people around it. So, yeah. um, and that has been super successful. And there are companies such as What If, mm -hmm. who have also been based on those um, types of um, initiatives and thinking around how to stimulate your right brain to come up with ideas. They're all kind of health based. I yeah, guess. perfect. Matthew, have you seen any examples of some great creative <coughs> brands out there? Um, shorting that there are a lot of brands trying to kind of capture this space um, and that's also one thing that we tr our kind of aim with hold is that the reason why we work with brands is that uh, we want to change the life of people we want to create the win win with the brands that are kind of involved and that they put up prices for you to change behavior and take the right choice uh, and we see this now with example we work with the Talk taco company or like a taco brand, a Tex-Mex brand, mm -hmm. that they want to like get people to have a proper uh, time together when they're having food. Like the dinner time, I think it's 59% are using their phones while they're having having a meal. Uh, but it's in Norway. Yeah, so it's I think probably here is higher. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe <laughs> higher. Yeah, but uh, so what we do is kind of we. Uh, the more people on hold, the more points you get, and then you can, and then you compete for like exclusive prices that only accessible for the group. Mm -hmm. So you need to be four people in order to access this uh, taco kit the next week, or win a win a win a taco trip to Mexico to see the kind of authentic 
taco place. <laughs> and I think that's the way that brands that can, can connect and actually change behavior for people, uh, it's a really interesting thing because people need help sometimes. Uh, yeah. And it's not that we always need the push in marketing and uh, the banner ad, uh, because then we tend to look for the X and the skip mm. instead of actually engaging with the mm. content. Driving participation, isn't it, rather mm. than just more being, being invasive. Uh, uh, we've got a couple of questions here, actually, from the audience, and one of them kind of leads on nicely from that. Uh, maybe one for, for you, Tia. Um, in your opinion, what can the big tech groups do to make the experience of using their platforms more calming and less addictive? Hmm. Well, okay, so there, there's been some initiatives. I think um, Instagram has um, is testing in some markets now the fact that um, people won't be able to see likes and comments yep. on other people's posts because this is... Um, one of the main drivers of anxiety mm. and uh, feeling n nervous because you post something and your post doesn't get any likes and this is especially for young mm. people but also <laughs> for us um, and and then us you oldies. see that yeah <laughs> And then you see for, um, you know, your friend is getting 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 likes on there. And that creates a lot of anxiety, uh, mm -hmm. first of all, apart from the visual input that you get from social media. But um, so the fact that they are testing now, the fact that only the person can see the number of likes and, and no one else can is already a huge step if they introduce mm -hmm. that. Um, because it's going to create less competition. It's mm -hmm. going to create a more serene, serene way, I guess, of scrolling, looking, because you're not obsessed about what actually yeah. people obsess uh, now when, when they are on yeah. social media. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, I guess, then uh, there needs to be um, a bigger uh, involvement and influence in education for younger adults. Because, yes, I know that now uh, both Facebook and Google have launched initiatives um, to, to monitor uh, screen time. but. It's not enough, really. Um, so I saw an interview with a young teen quite recently that uh, basically he said that sometimes just to take an Instagram uh, picture, he changes his shirt about 10 times. Can you imagine? Like, it's changing 10 times, going, yeah, in front of the mirror. And I think the education of how you could spend that time instead, um, it would, because th there's a lot of stress that goes into that. Can you imagine if you had to change 10 times oh, just no, to take no, that thank picture? You. Yeah. <laughs> far, far too busy as well. I don't know where all the time. Um, there's another uh, very interesting question, um, uh, maybe for, for you, Maths. With apps like Hold emerging and mindfulness becoming more important, do you think that there will be less time spent online by future generations? Um, I don't think like we will be still connected, uh, but I just think that we will spend it in a different way that we do today. We will not be... I, I, so I believe that in, in a few years that people will be able to see the kind of the, how the constant scrolling will affect you and what's the how much that waste. Like, social media, again, is great if you only talk to your friends, but the fact that you have to scroll down, etc., is wasting so much time. So I, be I believe that we will still be connected and use tech a lot, because tech is, like, great, uh, but we need the need to do something that... Uh, I, th I think that we have to look at how to kind of uh, generate the income today that people will care more about what their data is worth. They will question like that Facebook is generating billions and billions of mm. dollars because they have access to who I am, what I'm doing, and they have more, they know more about you than you know about yourself. And that, that's the thing like, uh, I think people, more and more people will understand that that's a value and question whether or not you will get, give people access to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose just to kind of finish things off then, I mean, clearly getting that, that balance is, is crucial. How do you guys achieve balance in your life? I, I'm sure we'd all love to learn how to ha lead a more balanced and uh, more healthy life. Um, shall I go first? Yeah. Um, for me, um, I guess there's a number of things, but the main thing that I will never kind of go by for a day without is morning routine. As I said earlier, I'm a morning person and I think those two hours before everyone wakes up, 
my two-year-old son and, <laughs> um, and then, you know, it, there's, uh, everything goes out the window. But um, I need those two hours to have time to reflect, meditate, um, do yoga, write, whatever it is. And, you know, it doesn't really matter. You don't have to be doing yoga or but form of exercise mm. really helps. But I think that is the solitude as well, like time with yourself is so, so important. And um, we spend less and less time with ourselves because when we're not with people, we are engaging on social media, which in a way is still being connected in, you know, in, in some ways, even though we're not probably connecting with someone. So time alone for me is super regenerative and renewing. And uh, yeah, I, I can never trade that. If I, if I don't get that time in the morning, then mm. my day is massively impacted mm. and do you look at screens during that time no absolutely no, no screens. no, no, no. So <laughs> switch off the you know put on uh, airplane mode in the evening and then i only put it back on once i finished my two hours in the morning brilliant brilliant i think we can all learn from that um Mads, what, what, what do you do um so i have this policy that i'm trying to follow as much as it's possible uh, that i don't work at home at all uh, I don't open my PC. Uh, I when I come home, the first thing I do, and also my girlfriend do, we put on hold. Uh, so we're holding as a group. Uh, but and then we also have the settings we have on our phones. It's also quite interesting how mm. you because mm. that's kind of the external triggers that make sure that you kind of check it or feel stressed. And uh, so I turned off every form for kind of notification. It's only specific people that can send through. Uh, it's more that I have to take active choice in order to check. And that goes for social media, that goes for, like uh, most of the channels we have in Slack, mm. I don't have on. It's only a few channels that are now this urgent. Uh, I need to jump on it right away. And I think also um, uh, the fact that we, I'm tr trying not to like, I'm just trying to, when I come home, it's rather to spend time with the ones I care about and not check my phones before I go to bed. Because yeah. especially checking emails before I go to bed, it's then, terrible then, terrible. then then my sleep is going to be affected quite, yeah. quite a lot by that. Uh, because you get your mind thinking a lot of things you haven't done, mm. of things happening next day. Uh, but I also start the day by writing out exactly what I need to do and what I would like to do if I have time. Uh, so I think that because be able to sketch out what's the focus hours, what's the, uh, where people shouldn't bother you at all, yeah. that's really important. Because I think the switching cost, uh, because it takes you 23 minutes to get back to the same focus when you switch to the next yeah. task. Mm -hmm. So when you believe that I'm just gonna check like a text message here or Facebook message and then go straight back to work, it takes you 23 minutes to go have the same level mm -hmm. as you had before. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that people need to think about when swapping around and having maybe email in the background. If you think about kind of, kind of that is one of the maybe time consuming thing. We're sending emails way too often, we'd CC on way too many people. Like I read that the, the average person gets 100 emails per day. And just if you have like, uh, uh, that's average, I believe there are some people that get a lot more. Uh, but if you believe that you spend two hours, two minutes per, two minutes per email, then you spend a lot of your work day yeah. on that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just, I just think that we need to understand how to best kind of act on those emails instead of getting stressed and having them up and checking them constantly. Mm -hmm. It's not that, not having the- Having your inbox constantly there. Yeah, like, oh my God, a new one, I need to check that. And then it's something that you need to rush and to start. Because when you send, when you send an email, it's not that urgent. When you call, it's super urgent. <laughs> so you can true, wait true. for, until you have your kind of email hours and label emails to what this needs to be answered right now, this needs to be answered by the end of the day, this needs to be answered by the end of the week. So you know when to spend time with important stuff instead of checking emails and going back reading it again and again. Then you basically check your email five times before you answer it. 
Sounds like a new app opportunity. <laughs> um, thank you both so much for joining us today, um, particularly to Matt for flying all the way in from Norway to join us today. Thanks. Um, thank you to those who have sent their questions and for tuning in. If you haven't checked out the Hold app, um, absolutely do. There's a link, I believe, in our Facebook feed. You can also obviously search for it in the Google Play and App Store. Um, join us next time in November when we'll be talking about diversity and inclusion and some of the work we're doing with the Female Foundry. Um, Indeed, if there are other topics that you'd like us to deep dive into, whether it's data, tech, creativity, diversity, whatever it might be, we'd love to hear from you. So um, just tweet us using the on-brand hashtag uh, and we'll do our best to build a series for you. So uh, thanks again, uh, Mads. Thank you for Tia for joining us. Thank you to those who've tuned in um, and have a good day. Catch you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>